And our final reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if a member of our church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of the fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him by the throat, saying, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And since I'm reading the scripture this morning, I thought I would also uh, lead our prayer for the preacher for today. So if you'll all pray with me. Dear Lord, we ask that you are with us not only on this Sunday and every Sunday when we meet to worship, but also in our daily lives. Every day as we go out into the world, help us to become the people you want us to be and help us to treat others as you want us to treat them. And we ask that you also have special prayers for Pastor Terry, not only as she leads us in our worship services and helps us to hear and understand your word, but also as she struggles with health concerns of her own and uh, what path she's gonna be taking to deal with those. And uh, help her to feel the love and support of this congregation. And that we pray in your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. My grandmother, my father's mom, a lot of people knew my grandfather, the old guy on the hill that sold tomato plants. My grandmother made the weirdest coleslaw anyone has ever had. Nobody could make her coleslaw. My mother couldn't make it. Aunt Bertie couldn't make it. I'm the only one who learned how to make it. But it took a while. Because I went to my grandmother and I said, we're going to figure out your coleslaw. We're going to deconstruct your coleslaw. So when she went to put the salt in, I said, stop, and I tried to measure it in a spoon, and she would look at me and fuss. She said, how much sugar? And I'd stop her and say, let me put it in a measuring cup and see how much sugar I need. She said, no, stop it. Stop it now. You'll never learn how to cook if you do it this way. And I said, well, how much sugar do you put in? And she said, enough. How much salt do you put in? You put in enough. She was right. Now I can make a coleslaw. I'm the only person who can. I wrote out the instructions for my family. It's like a 17-page spread to do this coleslaw. Nobody makes it anymore because it takes too long to make. Somebody asked me at the first service, did it taste the same way every time she made it? Absolutely the same way every time she made it. She knew to put in enough. Peter wants to know how many times is enough to forgive. He thinks you can measure it out and put it in a spoon or a cup and put it in. Because he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, thinking he's got a really good answer this time. Poor Peter again. Makes a mess of things, doesn't he? If my brother or sister in church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Seven is one of those magical biblical numbers. Because God created the world in six days and on the seventh day God rested. It means a lot. Jesus says, no, Peter, as many as seven times seven or 70 times 7, or 7 times 77. It's a lot of times, Jesus is saying. But what is he really saying? you got to forgive him enough. can't measure it out. He tells this awful, awful parable. This is one that scares me because it talks to me directly. 
Now, this, we listen in church. You listen politely to Rob reading that. You know what they would have done in the first century? They'd have been knee slapping, laughing, falling down. They thought this was the funniest thing they ever heard because this really is it's an indication of Jesus' great sense of humor because we listen to it as holy, holy, holy scripture. They would have listened to it for the first time. They would have been laughing hysterically. Why? What's so funny about this? A king? That's good. Clark just shrugged like, I don't know. Tell me. Let me tell you. A king lending that much money to a slave is a laughable thing. Because, you know, you sit there and you hear denarii and talents and you think, wow, this must be this much money. It would be like winning the lottery when it goes over a billion dollars. It's not the kind of money a king would usually have available, and yet he lends it to a slave. That would have been a real knee slapper there, right? And if you were a slave and your boss let you have five bazillion dollars, what would you do? I'd take off to another land and change my name. But no. He lends him the money. And then it comes due and he can't pay it back. Surprise, surprise, surprise. How many of you can pay back a loan like that? Maybe you ever have a mortgage on your house? I got one right now. But if my mortgage were nine million dollars, I would never live long enough to pay it off. So he goes to his king and says, King, I just need a little bit more time. Give me some time and I can pay you back. And the king says, okay, fine. That would have been another knee slapper there, folks. People would have laughed hysterically at that one as well. And then he goes out and immediately somebody comes up to him and says, I owe you some money, don't I? Yes, you do, and I want it right now. Now, the hundred denarii, that was a big sum of money, a chunk of money, but it was a doable chunk of money, except what does the guy do to him? Throws him in jail. What's the problem with being in jail and trying to work off a debt? The average salary of being in jail is not very high, especially in this situation. So, you know, and it wasn't just you that went to jail. It was your wife, your kids. They sold your possessions to make payment if you owe something. And he begged the same exact words, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Now, the king had pity on him, but what does the slave do? He says, no, you're going to jail, buddy boy. Well, everything's happy in his world until his friends who've seen this go to the king and say, what? Guess what he did? The one that you forgave will not forgive someone else. The king calls him in and they have some words. And he says, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. Now, what did I say about that debt that was so big it would never be paid off? So he's going to be tortured how long? Forever, or at least until he dies of being tortured. Now, this is the hard part. This is the part that I have trouble reading. I have trouble because it makes me get chills. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart. From your heart. So we pray every Sunday. I told the kids. We like to use words like trespass, right? For you those who trespass against me. Trespass means somebody come on your property, doesn't it? Forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. That's a little bit closer, but the real English translation would be forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, which is really saying, forgive me, Lord, but only to the extent that I'm willing to forgive somebody else. That's when those words bite me. They sneak up on me and go, uh-oh. Now let's look at the story we told with the kids, the story of Joseph. Joseph forgives his brothers. They put him in a hole and try to sell him. They're scared. They want to go to him on their knees. They offer to be his slaves, and he cries. They cry. It's a big scene of welcome, and forgiveness. Maybe that's hard to understand, but he says, God intended for good what you used for evil. And he can see God's hand in that. That's Joseph. And then the epistle lesson. Those who are weak in faith. are supposed to welcome those who are weak in faith. Some believe eating anything while others eat only vegetables. This is not a condemnation of vegetarianism by any stretch of the imagination. It's saying, if you eat vegetables, you're weak. You should be eating your vegetables. I know some of you do not like vegetables. We've had that talk. But he's talking about meat being sacrificed to idols in the temple. They don't want to eat that because that's when the, the others in the land, the Romans, make them sacrifice to their gods. And then 
people don't want to eat the meat. They're saying some people eat it because it's like it's just meat. Just don't buy into that nonsense. And some people condemn them and they point fingers at each other. But this is Paul saying to them, don't condemn people. Don't quarrel over this. Don't judge one another because God has welcomed them. Why are you to pass judgment on servants of another? Servants of God is what he's talking about. Now, I doubt y'all pass judgment on each other about people eating meat sacrificed to idols, but then how does this translate into the modern church? Oh, it does, doesn't it? You know what she did? Let me tell you about what she did. Or Have you seen his tattoos? And he comes into this building. Can you believe he comes into the building with tattoos all over himself? That boy has a mohawk. That girl has this. That girl has that. We do find ways to separate ourselves from other people, don't we? Not always nice ways. We tend to look at other people. I tell you what happens when somebody has a sin that ends up in the newspaper. People go wild. But the best of all time was when I was at someone's 50th anniversary party. We were having cake, celebrating 50 years of marriage between a couple who truly loved each other with their three children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. Somebody came up to me and said, well, you know they had to get married, don't you? I said, well, it looks like it took. They had to get married. You need to know that, Pastor. I said, why do I need to know that? I said, shame on you for telling me somebody else's sin. We tend to judge each other, don't we? Yes. This one steps on my toes, too. We all judge each other, don't we? For different reasons. But we're called to forgive one another in the name of Jesus Christ who forgave us. I told you the story before about the two brothers I had. One sat in that corner, one sat in this corner. I said, why don't you ever sit together? They said, I don't talk to him. I haven't talked to him in 40 years. I said, why do you sit in opposite corners so we never have to go to communion at the same time? Wow. And my friend who was a pastor, I went to her house. I was babysitting her little boy who now has a child who looks just like him. Scary what happens over 38 years. But someone knocked on the door, and a man came to the door, looked, spit an image of a guy that I had met from our congregation. He told me his name. I said, he must be Bunny's brother. It's a man who brought his pastor chocolate every week, and I almost killed that because he threw it on the floor and stormed out. And I said to her, well, later, what did I say that was so wrong? And she said, you mentioned Bunny's name. They haven't spoken to each other in probably 30 years. Brothers, Wow. Sad stuff when that happens, isn't it? Breaks the heart of a pastor, I know that. But how do we learn to forgive one another? Because there are things, I don't know what happened between these two sets of brothers. They never shared that with me. I don't even know if they remembered or not. But I know they held it against one another greatly for all those years. All those many, many years. So how do you learn to forgive? It's a tough question, isn't it? Because it's not easy to forgive. It's easier than forgetting, but it's not as easy as forgiving. Forgiving is easy if you remember who forgave you and what you have been forgiven. That's why I have that crucifix in my house. I was brought it this morning and I walked out without it because my dog was trying to get out and I pushed her back, put the crucifix down and it's in my house laughing at me right now. But it was a gift that was given to me, not by a Catholic, but by two Methodist children that I married one year gave me this crucifix. They got it at a Catholic yesterday. One of those little ones that cost like three ninety nine, four ninety nine. And I had it for years in a box. And then I looked at it one day and I thought, I need to look at this every day. Hung it over my bedroom door. It's not hanging there now because I'm not sleeping in my room because I can't get in my bed yet. I'll work on that one of these days. But it hangs over my door because every day, that's the first thing I see when I open my eyes. And when I walk out of the door, I look up and I think, whatever happens to me today is nothing compared to what you did for me, Jesus Christ, my Savior. Now, members of my family don't like the crucifix because they think it's way too Catholic. Somebody said to me, what is that thing up there? I said, that's my Lord and Savior. I said, well, I worship a resurrected Lord. I said, I worship a resurrected Lord who went to the cross for my sin to forgive me. If I ever forget that, boy, am I in trouble. Because then I can hold other people's sin against them a lot easier. But nope, every day I look at that and I think, God, forgive me my sin and let me forgive other people their sin. 
Forgiveness is an act of will, just like agape, I've said before, is an act of will. Oh, talked about the forgiveness of someone else. The Amish community, we started the book Amish Grace before the pandemic, never finished the study, and I think some of you, I hope, finished the book. The Amish take communion once a year. Did you know that? Just one time a year, right before Easter. But they don't take it until everybody in the church has forgiven everyone else. They're honest people, so they will sometimes take two or three days working out their forgiveness. In the Amish community, you don't go to another church if you get mad at somebody in your church. You stay there and work it out. You don't get to go down the road and say, I'm going to go there. You don't get to do that. You stay in your own community and you work things out. That's a great practice to have because I got to tell you, Epworth is a church that can hold a grudge like nothing I've ever seen. There are people in here who hold grudges like nothing I've ever seen. You got to learn to let it go, folks. The way to let it go is to look at the people through the, the prism, through the power, through the cross of Jesus Christ, your Savior. It's the only way to let go of something. The way to say I can truly forgive doesn't mean you have to forget. That's another thing about Amish grace. Reconciliation is not the same thing as forgiveness. You can forgive someone without reconciling with them. You don't have to invite them over to dinner all the time because you're not called to be abused. And I've sat through many a sermon where pastors have sent women back to be abused again and again and again by husbands who cannot control their tempers. That is not what we're called to be. It's like the difference between being a foot washer and a doormat. There's a big difference between being a foot washer and a doormat. The similarity is both of them clean your feet. It's like the difference between humility and humiliation. One is what you decide you're going to do, and the other is something that's done to you. They both come from the same root, which is humble. Humble comes from the word hummus, which means earth. And if you think hummus tastes like dirt, there you go. But it means earth, earth. Humble means meek and pliable and ready to be made new. You don't have to reconcile, but you do have to forgive. You can even forgive somebody who's dead. Did you know that? There are people who will hold grudges till someone they'll say, I can't stand my father. He did horrible things to me, and I'll never forgive him. But you can forgive him and free yourself. Try to find the origin of this quote and some people say it goes back to St. Augustine, others say it goes back to the 1930s, but you've heard it before because I've said it before and I'll keep saying it till the day I die. Withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Think about that. Withholding forgiveness and holding on to resentment and grudges and nastiness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. They're not going to die, but it's going to kill you slowly, but surely it will kill you because it will rob you of your joy, it will rob you of your peace, it will rob you of the ability to forgive another person, it will rob you of the ability to be forgiven if you listen to these words. What was it that Jesus said? Jesus, Jesus talking. The Son of God, the Messiah. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart. Not easy. It's not a magic wand. People seem to think pastors have magic wands that we can just wave over people's head and make everything better. If I had one, I'd wave it over my own head and make my knees stop hurting, make my shoulders stop hurting, make my voice better again. But it's not like that. But it is possible because it's not magic. It's a miracle. It's God acting in your heart and in your life to make you a forgiving person, which you can be. Just let God soften your heart. You have to remember what God has forgiven you to be able to forgive someone else. But if you can remember that every day, you will be able to look at someone else and say, I can forgive you for what you did to me. Even if somebody puts you in a hole and sells you to slave traders, you can forgive them for that. Or if someone excludes you in the church, you can forgive them for that. Another story I've told again because it hurt me so much the day it happened. A young woman who came to my congregation with this little baby boy, about two years old, and he had been born prematurely. He weighed a pound when he was born, just 16 ounces, and he survived. And at two years old, he was a little bit on the small side, but she was a tiny little thing herself. She came in. She knew every hymn in the hymnal, every song in the faith we sing, every song in the song and worship book. She knew every song that had ever been written about Jesus and sang her heart out. 
Somebody came to me and said, she really needs to dress better. She wants to come to church. And I said, shame on you for looking at how she dresses and judging her for how she dresses. She wore blue jeans. Oh, my gosh, to church blue jeans. Heavens to Betsy. Raise your hand if you ever had on blue jeans in your life. Wow. My goodness gracious. And I said, oh, don't you dare say anything to her. So they didn't say anything to her. But what they did was they went up and they folded their arms and they stood where she could hear, and they said, people don't know how to dress, maybe they should just stay home, and she never came back again. Visited her. She lived in the projects. And they said, she needs to control that baby, because he got loose from her one day and ran up and gave me a hug while I was preaching. I just picked him up, carried him back, gave him to his mom. Who says, that was horrible. That was just, just ruined my worship experience. I said, get over yourself. Ruins your worship, get over yourself. But went to see her. Told me her life story. Her grandmother was the head of the United Methodist Women of the Virginia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, which is the biggest, oldest, most prestigious one, which meant her grandmother came out of a big church, big church. And she went to college, this girl, and she fell in love with a boy, and she had sex with him, had a baby out of wedlock. My goodness. And she married the boy, but he sold drugs. He couldn't hold a job, but she tried to stay married to him, and they were living in the projects. He was working sometimes, sometimes not. She had a little baby that almost died. We sat down, we talked, and she said, I feel bad enough about my life. I don't need to go to church and feel worse about my own life. I begged her to come back. She never set foot in that church again. I doubt she ever set foot in another church, because this is why people don't come to us, because they look at us and they say, they preach forgiveness, and then they judge one another. We got to get out of the business of judgment. We got to get out of the business of welcoming and forgiving and grace and peace and mercy and all those things. Because if we don't do it, where is the world going to go? When I was in seminary, there was a woman named Brenda who had a boy named Elliot. He was three. Elliot's in his 40s now. Brenda was not there to be a pastor. She was there to be a Christian educator. But Elliot was born out of wedlock. Even at the seminary, people said, "Can you believe she would come here like that with that baby?" Somebody said that to me. I said, where else should she go but to Jesus Christ, her Savior? We've got to stop judging each other over what we wear or what we say or how we've done things or mistakes we've made. If we don't do that, the world will never know grace unless they know it in us. I'm going to ask you, we're going to go into a time of prayer after we sing the hymn. We're going to have a prayer confession. It's not even communion Sunday. We're going to confess our sins. But I want you to look especially at verse 3 of the hymn we're going to sing. In blazing light, your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew. What trivial debts are owed to us, how great our debt to you. When you look at somebody else and look at their sin and are tempted to judge them, think of all the things that Christ has forgiven you, and you will change your heart. It might take a while, but your heart will change because God's going to melt it down until it's pliable like the earth. It's humble. So, you can try to do the math here. Say 7 times 7, Jesus. 70 times 7. Or you can say, I need to forgive enough. There is never enough forgiveness in the world. Never enough forgiveness. Amen, amen, amen. Let us sing together. Please.